feel a little like a uh, museum tour guide here with this fancy lavalier. But um, Doug, I didn't know what you were going to say there. Uh, I'm glad you didn't suggest that what Phil Ford and I shared was a jump shot, because uh, that certainly wasn't the case. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening. It, it, it's, a, it's really a great privilege, and I thank all of you for turning out on a rainy Thursday evening when Doug and Rick and Ann Louise approached me several months ago with this invitation. I think I tried to wait a reasonable amount of time before saying yes, but it probably wasn't more than about 30 seconds, and uh, I've been looking forward to this ever since. So, Doug, thank you for the opportunity, and again, thank all of you for being here on a rainy Thursday evening. Let's, um, let's start with something that makes us proud. Carolina is America's first public university. And I want you to say that with me, and as you do, take note of where the emphasis falls. So I'm going to do it one more time and then ask you to take your turn. Carolina is America's first public university. All right, so now your turn. All right, ready? Carolina is America's first public. university. For more than two centuries, that word public has been our guide star, but it its meaning has never been fixed or, or static. That word has, in fact, been defined and redefined, sometimes radically, as successive generations have rethought the relationship between the university and the larger society that gives it life. And this evening, what I'd like to do is share with you a meditation on the public university. And with your indulgence, I'd like to think out loud a bit about the ways that Successive generations of Tar Heels, generations before us, have answered the question, what's a university for? Particularly, what's a public university for? And I want to offer some thoughts on how answers to that question might shape our understanding in our own time of this university's work today and in the future. So where does the story start? The story starts in the late 18th century, when the University of North Carolina was born, a child of an age of revolution. Its founders believed that a public investment in higher education was required to prepare leaders for a radical political experiment, the founding of a republic, a society to be governed by its citizens and not by a monarch. But the meanings of those words, public and citizen, they were narrowly construed at the time of Carolina's founding. Only young men of privilege, most of them the sons of a slave-holding elite, studied here. And throughout the first half of the 19th century, the education they received was deeply conservative in the root sense of that word. They studied a classical curriculum prescribed for them by the faculty. This was it. There were no choices. There were no electives. And they approached the ancients not as we might do today, not with questions, but with the expectation of acquiring knowledge that had been passed down through the ages, changeless and immutable. And that approach to learning was quite well suited to a slaveholder's world. The young men who studied here, in fact, found comfort in the idea that both truth and the social relationships that bound slaves to their masters, that both were impervious to time. It was, after all, ideas of change and reform, or what some people called progress, that threatened to destroy slavery, to kick the props from beneath what was known as the Southern way of life. In the 1850s, students, these students, unleashed astounding indictments of science and its restless, questioning habit of mind. They warned that the torch of civil war was about to be lit by the same genius that originated the railway and the steamship. The powers of inventiveness and imagination that were responsible for the magnetic telegraph, they said, also stood accountable for the wild speculations of the hellhounds of abolitionism. Well, as it turned out, their fears were well-founded. The Civil War destroyed slavery, and with it, what would become to be remembered 
as the old university. In the war's aftermath, Carolina began to reinvent itself to become the research university that we'd recognize today. In 1876, the trustees, led by Kemp Battle there at the center, divided this institution into six colleges, each of them with several departments offering a variety of courses in politics, literature, history, and the sciences. Now, that plan was, at least in 1876, largely aspirational. In some cases, a single faculty member constituted the entirety of two or three departments. But the idea was there. And they adopted that plan, they explained, to keep pace with what they call the late 19th century march of knowledge and invention and discovery. Their new university would no longer serve as a storehouse for eternal truths. It would be transformed, they said, into a great metropolis of thought. You just have to love this sort of late Victorian hyperbole. A great metropolis of thought. And they went on. Just as the world's seaport sustained the flow of commerce, the university would operate as a marketplace of ideas by gathering, creating, distributing new knowledge. It would become a great stimulus to economic development. It would become the dynamo of an industrial and commercial new south. And those changes sent ripples through every aspect of the campus, altering the composition of the faculty, the methods of instruction, and even the attitudes of students. The Christian ministers who had once taught Greek and Latin were replaced by new men who were trained as scholarly specialists and whose training was certified by a degree that was new to America. It had been borrowed from German universities, the PhD, the Doctorate of Philosophy. And when those professors taught their classes, they no longer relied on memory work and recitation. Instead, they lectured to their students. Now, you can imagine how difficult it is for me every year to convince my students that being lectured to uh, it was a radical innovation. But it was at the end of the 19th century. They lectured to students in order to bring them the latest knowledge in their fields. And they sent those students to the library into laboratories to do investigations of their own. And as the students worked up their lessons, they competed for distinction by winning grades according to a new, a brand new numerical scale. If you'd been here before the Civil War, at the end of every semester, you, or really your parents, would have received a letter indicating that your performance had been good, bad, or tolerable. <laughs> My students like that idea. In the late 19th century, they were evaluated by numerical grades, the kinds of grades we know today. Their performance was measured by a god-awful beastly invention called the GPA. Now think about it for a moment, right? We take it for granted, but just think about how bizarre this is, right? At the end of every semester, my students now get a transcript that figures their grade out to three decimal places, one one-thousandth of a point. It makes no sense at all. It has no mathematical significance. But they don't question it because it's so embedded in the way that we teach and learn today. But if you go back at the end of the 19th century, people talked about why it was, why this new invention had been put in place. They talked about it as a those grades as a figurative form of capital. The idea is that you could look at your transcript almost like a ledger book, and you could parse the differences between winners and losers out to a third decimal place. This was an education that was geared to change. It was an education meant to prepare students not just to find their place in the world, but to go out and to remake that world in their own image. Here one student explained, we are taught to think, not to accept theories and creeds simply because our ancestors handed them down, but to think things through for ourselves. But during the opening decades of the 20th century, university leaders further enlarged the remit of the public university by directing that work of inquiry and reform out into communities across the state and throughout the South. In his inaugural address delivered in 1915, UNC President Edward Kidder Graham 
outlined his vision for a university that would, he said, provide a program of guidance for the state, one that would lift North Carolina from beneath its heavy burdens of poverty and illiteracy and ill health. Now, tragically, Graham had little time to implement that vision. He gave that address in 1915. Three years later, in 1918, he died, just a few days after his 42nd birthday, a victim of the Spanish flu pandemic that killed millions, tens of millions, around the globe at the end of World War I. But his successor, Harry Woodburn Chase, had an even grander idea. At his inauguration in 1920, Chase issued a call, in his words, to broaden the vision of Edward Kidder Graham by extending the university's horizons to the South at large. And so it was that in the 20s and 30s, Carolina first distinguished itself as an institution of national stature, standing, reputation, by focusing critical scholarship here on its own backyard by setting itself apart as a self-styled sanctuary of freedom, a mecca of learning and creativity in a region that often had very little patience for either of those pursuits. At mid-century and the decades after World War II, great waves of change swept across this campus again and revised once more our conception, our, our understanding of what it means to be a public university. First, the GI Bill of Rights brought thousands of first-generation students to this campus. Then the Civil Rights Movement opened the doors to black students whose exclusion had long mocked the fact that their slave ancestors had built much of the campus and had produced the wealth that sustained the university in its early years. And the Women's Movement lowered the last barriers to access for female students, whose presence had long been limited and tightly regulated. So more and more, the university began to resemble, began to look like the larger society that it promised to serve. And as the student body changed, literally as the student body changed, demands for curriculum reform mounted. Carolina added new programs in African-American studies, in women's studies, eventually in sexuality studies, Latino-Latino studies, Native American and Jewish studies, each of which broaden the scope of what we teach, of what we privilege and enshrine as knowledge. Now, I know that some here in that litany or in that list they hear a litany of intellectual fads and fashions, but, but I hear something different. I hear in that list the chorus of a university that today is more open, more humane, more public than at any time in its past. So this history I've recounted, and admittedly I've done it in very, very broad strokes, but this history warrants remembrance particularly now as we look forward to University Day and the installation of a new chancellor. This history bears remembrance because it's a measure of our achievement, and if we choose to use it as such, it can be a compass for charting our future. We can extract from it, I want to suggest to you, three principles to guide us through our own tumultuous time, a time when the very idea of a public university is, again, very much up for grabs. Here is the first of those principles. A Carolina education is a public good, a public good and an integral part of American democracy. What I mean by that is by opening doors of opportunity for individual students it also improves the welfare of us all. And that became a commonplace assumption of public policy in the decades after World War II. Think, for example, of those men and women I mentioned earlier who went to college, who came to college under the GI Bill. They became scientists and engineers, inventors and entrepreneurs. They put a man on the moon. They eradicated smallpox. They developed vaccines. <clears throat> 
A little water will help. They developed vaccines to vanquish other diseases that for much of human history had been relentless killers. They engineered a green revolution to feed billions around the globe, and they sparked the digital revolution that has in our time put all the world's knowledge at the fingertips of anyone with a mobile phone. Those students and their sons and daughters, the baby boomers who followed them, also enlarged the ranks of what political philosopher Mala Singh describes as a critical citizenry. They took the new social and humanistic knowledge produced in America's universities, and they used it to bring into our own, into our national narrative, the voices and experiences of citizens who had long been marginalized and dispossessed. They used that knowledge to build understanding across differences of language and history and culture, to cultivate empathy and the ability to see the world through the eyes of others. They used that knowledge to promote human rights at home and abroad and to make a more just nation. All of that came to pass. All of that came to pass because of public investment in students who a generation or two earlier could never have imagined coming to Carolina. My wife Diane and I are two of those students, and I know that many of you here tonight are as well. Today, I'm afraid those accomplishments, they are often, too often taken for granted, sometimes willfully forgotten. So much so that speaking of higher education as a public good begins to seem a little quaint and maybe even a little naive. We live in a time in which the market is the holy grail, in which higher education is thought of as a commodity and students are viewed as consumers. We live in a time in which policymakers, by cutting public investment, are shifting more and more of the cost of higher education's public benefits. Let me say that again. By cutting investments, are shifting more and more of public higher education's benefits to the common good, shifting more and more of that cost onto the shoulders of students and families who are buried beneath a growing mountain of debt. That's not good public policy, as Edward Kidder Graham observed nearly a century ago. Writing in his presidential report in 1916, he declared public funding for higher education to be, he said, the supreme issue of the day. This is because the fundamentals of democracy have all of their vital roots in education. Equality of opportunity is there too, and there alone. And in his view, public policy that ignored those truths, that policy, he said, was empty, misleading, and hopelessly barren. Edward Kidder Graham didn't mince words, nor should we. Phrased in a different way, this was his point. Public higher education, he said, is basic both to the future development of society and to the individual life chances of citizens. And it's for that reason that it's the proper and necessary business of government. Now, having made that appeal to public responsibility and the common good, President Graham was equally concerned to remind students of the reciprocal nature of the investment that their fellow North Carolinians had made in them. No student, he explained, is truly trained unless he realizes that he does not live to himself alone, but is part of an organic community life that is the source of most of the privileges he enjoys. Every year with that thought in mind, I um, end my large undergraduate survey course on North Carolina history by asking my students as they fold up their notebooks and get ready for the final exam to ponder a question that was first asked of me by Bill Friday. 
I ask that they reflect on the magnificent gift that they and I, you and we, have been given by the people of this state. We're privileged to teach and learn here, thanks to the generosity of hardworking North Carolinians, most of whom have never been to Chapel Hill and few of whom have children who will study at Chapel Hill. It's remarkable if you think about it. They get up every morning, they rise every morning, they go to their jobs, many of them will go to two jobs before the day is out, they pay their taxes, and they support Carolina because this is their university. And because they believe that their investment in us will pay a dividend to themselves, to their children, and to the public good. So the question for us, the question I ask my students to ponder is what will we make of that gift? It's not a question about guilt, it's a question about responsibility. It's a question about returning what we have been given in equal if not in greater measure. And every time I ask that question, I'm so grateful to Bill for asking it of me. Now that challenge points directly to principle number two. The public university, to quote Edward Kidder Graham once more, is an instrument for doing the work of the world. That's a simple enough phrase, right? But it can also be, as you're well aware, a source of great consternation and the focus of fierce debate, particularly as it concerns the value and relevance of the liberal arts. This touches a nerve for historians. The debate grabs headlines today, it uh, shows up in cartoons like this one, but there's really nothing new about it. In his inaugural address delivered in 1931, University President Frank Porter Graham, Edward's cousin, took note of impassioned arguments that echo still. In these days, he said, we hear on one side that the liberal arts should be abolished and university work be made immediately professional and vocational. And on the other side, that liberal arts education should not only be divorced from any specific connection with the professions and vocations, but should not include any subject that has utilitarian value. <laughs> Fooey on your boat, he said. That argument was a dead end. What he recommended instead was an integrated approach that he explained would sharpen students' imaginative vitality and by doing so prepare them to participate creatively in what he called the problems of the modern world. That formulation of the university's work challenged students and faculty alike. As Frank Porter Graham thought about what it might mean for students, my guess is that he thought back to a speech that Cousin Edward had given in 1916, welcoming members of the freshman class to campus. He and the first year class were gathered in Gerard Hall, and he stood there at the front of the room and he asked them to reflect on why they had come to Chapel Hill. Why are you here? Have you come to prepare for a career in business or law or medicine? Have you come to be a sports hero? Have you come to excel in the classroom and, and claim your Phi Beta Kappa key? And you can see all of them nodding, right? They're going to get affirmation. Well, he pauses, he looks at them and says, well, if the answer to any of those questions is yes and another, nothing more, my suggestion is that you pack your bags and go home. The students were, of course, stunned. My students tend to be doubly stung, those who are quick and understand that in telling the story, I'm asking exactly the same question to them and offering precisely the same advice. But I go on to explain, as Graham went on to explain, those were admirable goals, but they were also incomplete. The core purpose of a Carolina education, Graham insisted, was to develop what he called an intellectual way of life one that was curious, skeptical, open to seeing the world in fresh new ways. And he promised that if some students embraced that habit of mind, everything else would follow. 
It would prepare them for rich and rewarding lives and for prosperous careers. It would also make them into leaders who would improve the lives of others, who would go from this place and make the world better than they found it. Now, Edward Kidder Graham didn't address the role of faculty in cultivating that intellectual way of life, but I think I know what he and Cousin Frank would say if they were here this evening. They would urge us to attend to our students' development of what I'd describe as translational skills. What do I mean by that phrase, translational skills? Well, what I mean very simply is students' ability to connect what they know to what they aspire to do in the world. And therein, I think, lies one of the most exciting challenges of our time because it's a, this is an aspect of undergraduate education to which we and our peers have given insufficient attention. The results are perhaps most visible when our students are making the transition to employment or to graduate and professional study. They present fabulous resumes. Every time I read one, I'm thankful that I was admitted in 1973 because it wouldn't happen now. Sometimes I'm not sure it happened, how it happened then either, for that matter. But extraordinary resumes. But then they run into difficulty. They run into difficulty moving beyond a list of accomplishments to articulate the skills and the competencies and the experiences that set them apart from the rest. And whenever I see that happen, I think back to a meeting with an alumnus. It was actually in London. I'd been in this job, I think, maybe six weeks. Really pleasant guy. We had a very nice meeting. And then he turned on me. He leaned over the table, and he wagged his finger in my face, and he said, do you know what your job is? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I quit. Where's the door? And then he answered. He said, your job is to give those students a story to tell. I've thought about having that tattooed somewhere. <laughs> it's a profound statement. That's our job, to give our students a story to tell. The problem that we confront today is much like the one that Frank Graham diagnosed in his inaugural address in 1931. Here's how he explained it. He said that it was too easy for students to make an efficient routine of work in the laboratory and fail to realize that in quiet laboratories work scholars who are blazing the highways of the world's light. Students dig out facts, but often have no sense of humility or opportunity in the discovery of truth. They can, he said, work daily in the stacks and miss the decisive significance of the library as the reservoir from which the streams of history gather momentum and direction. So what's to be done? Or for starters, I think we should look for ways to talk, to talk more with our students about the question of what a university is for. We have an undergraduate curriculum built around the concept of connections, of of drawing together disparate realms of human knowledge. But, you know, we seldom share with students the reasons we believe that connection making will matter. As they set out to tackle the great problems of the modern world or the great problems of their local communities, or as they maneuver their way through a world of employment in which these numbers are staggering, in which more than 85% of new jobs will involve knowledge work and in which the U.S. Department of Labor estimates that on average they will change jobs nine times. Not before the time of retirement, before the age of 32. Now for someone who's had one job going to school since he was in kindergarten, that's hard to fathom. Nine times by, time, by the age of 32. If we're to prepare students for that future, I think we also need to look for creative ways to collapse the distance that too often separates academic advising from career development. I mean, imagine the benefit of encouraging students to think not at the end, but from the beginning of their college careers about integrating the knowledge and the skills they're acquiring. 
One way to do that would be to bring students, academic advisors, and career specialists, bring them all together from the time that students first arrive on campus, and perhaps support students in developing not four years, but maybe even 10-year plans for their education. Plans that would stretch beyond graduation, plans that would support students in exploring multiple career opportunities, plans that would guide them more thoughtfully through the process of choosing the learning experiences in classrooms, in laboratories, in internships that they'll need in order to build their futures and realize their ambitions. Introducing that sort of intentionality, I think, would be one way to yield the full promise of a liberal arts education, both idealistic and practical. Students would leave Carolina as more engaged citizens, as deeper, more creative thinkers, and as far more effective leaders. They would leave here as practitioners of an intellectual way of life. And the results, I think, would be transformative for them, would be transformative for this university. I'm going to engage in a bit of hyperbole myself, but I think also transformative for this state and for the nation and the world. It's an opportunity to do big things. Now, finally, principle number three. The public university is a crucible of inclusive democracy. At its very best, it brings together a motley, I, I think maybe I should say heterogeneous, but I like the word motley, so I'll stick with it. A motley assemblage of students and faculty and staff and alumni who come from different life circumstances, who arrive in Chapel Hill with what at times can seem to be irreconcilable beliefs and worldviews, and the university asks that they be tolerant of one another and that they subject articles of faith and certainty to critical examination. For students, that experience could be at once unsettling and liberating. I know it was for me. It asked that they set aside received wisdom, that they think for themselves. And often, for the first time in their lives, they assemble a system of ethical judgment that is genuinely their own. I had a teacher named Bill Gear. I always described him, some of you may not remember him, as, um, as the man who put a whisk in my ear during my first semester here. About half the, halfway through the semester, I didn't know what I believed. At the end of the semester, I was thrilled that I had actually figured it out for myself. It was an extraordinary experience. Today, new teaching technologies offer powerful means of, of advancing that work and, and, and also, and this is often the case with new technologies, also great potential for undermining it. The possibilities would have been unimaginable just a decade ago with video teleconferencing. We can bring students from across the street and from opposite sides of the world together face to face in a virtual classroom. And through MOOCs, massively open online courses, we can deliver instruction to populations at home and abroad that otherwise would have no access to the college experience or, for that matter, exposure to one another. But those technologies can also cut in the opposite direction. Some critics of the public university see in the new instructional technologies a means of, of casting off what they believe to be the academy's political bias and of sharply reducing, if not zeroing out, the need for a public subsidy of higher education. They imagine a future in which instructional content will be prepackaged in digital form, offered up in a marketplace where people gather in various affinity groups and pick and choose according to their particular interest and proclivities. One economist who, who champions that reconfiguration describes it as unbundling and explains that it is, he says, analogous to putting together your own vacation to Europe instead of buying the package deal. I, I, I kind of have a hard time figuring out how that's an endorsement, but there it is. That vision strikes me as radically dystopian, and, and not for reasons some might immediately suggest, that is, that it undermines the authority, the traditional authority of the professoriate. It strikes me as radically dystopian because it would squander one of public higher education's great strengths. 
And that's the capacity to bring us together with people who are not like us and to expose us to ideas that challenge our most basic assumptions about ourselves and the world. I fear that in unbundled higher education, there could be little room for Edward Kidder Graham's intellectual way of life. So to pull all of that together and, and to give you a parting thought, let me turn one more time to Frank Porter Graham. In 1939, speaking to students at Berea College, he was speaking to them shortly after Hitler's troops had invaded Poland and had set the world once again on a path to war. Graham spelled out the value of a public university, and he spelled out also the moral of the tale that I've spun this evening. We should realize, he said, that our strongest defense in the long run is not a huge army, but more equal educational opportunity for all. And that our American democracy will be more truly tested in what we do about glaring inequalities than what we merely profess on the 4th of July. In the college air of freedom, he said, traditions of honor become robust with obligations upon college men and women to help make the world freer and fairer to all. It is the personal and social responsibility of college men and women to give all ideas a fair hearing, to interpret and champion the freedom and rights of despised minorities, regardless of race, color, class, or creed, to offset vested power with social justice. So said Frank Graham. Park the sound. Oh, you're very kind. There must have been something in the water. Um, I'm mindful of people's schedules this evening, but I'd also be happy to take two or three questions uh, and also delighted to hang around afterwards and talk as long as you'd like. So um, if you have a question you'd like me to take a swing at, uh, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, sure. The provost. So when this did, is the job interview. Yeah. When, <laughs> when did geography become a respectable subject for? When, did you look at the first slide? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> when, yeah. When, when did geography become a legitimate? Uh, it actually was quite late. It's not <laughs> until the late 19th century. When yeah. Michael Jordan majored in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly raised its status. Yeah. Good catch. Yeah. Yeah. I have to not stand up there. I, I can't be in a classroom without walking around. Hi. Um, thanks for speaking with sure. us today. Um, I just wanted to go back to your thought on sort of the extended student plan, mm -hmm. like instead of planning for four years, why 10? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and how that idea would fit students who come to a university to find out what they want right. to do, right. don't already have a plan. Right. Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. I, and, and thanks for the opportunity to to sort of make clear then when I say a plan, I, I don't want to get you nailed down to something early on. In fact, I often find myself saying to students, you know, you're here because you've been on a plan all the way through high school, you've executed, and that got you into Carolina. And I find myself saying, now for God's sake, please put the plan aside uh, and enjoy a little serendipity. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is really an opportunity to have that kind of conversation with students very early on, to talk about the logic that holds the curriculum together, to bring you together with faculty, with academic advisors, with people in career services, who could actually help you. I think one of the things that happens is, is students, uh, even if they come here ready to explore, they quickly get tracked in a particular direction because the reality is, you know, you, you know a few career tracks from watching television and sort of the larger world out there. But one of the things, great things about coming to university is you discover all these fields happened to me. I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know what the words meant. But an opportunity to have that conversation, so a plan that allows you room, right, 
to, to, to range, to explore, um, to not feel like the game is up if I, if I don't take this course and then that course. But, but faculty and, and others who can help you with that, really be a partner in that as you begin to sort of discern a career path and then think very intentionally you know, about how to put it together. I mean, I'm afraid for a lot of students, you can tell me whether this is or isn't true, the curriculum, the risk is it becomes a set of checkboxes as opposed to a set of opportunities. So my sense of a plan is a pretty loose thing. Uh, yeah, that, I wouldn't mind getting you off some of that plan. Great, <coughs> great talk, Jim. Uh, I'd like to hear your comments on uh, uh, how much state funding affects the publicness, publicness of a university. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we live in an era in which we, I guess the percentage of funding for UNC from the state is what? 25, 30 percent, Jim? Knows better than I do around uh, And, so. you know, you've got the, got the case of UVA, yeah. you know, which has right. really gone toward a private right. model to some degree. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on the money side of it? Yeah, I worry about that. I mean, it's, of course, a difficult question. I mean, in, in part, the percentage drop is because the institution itself is so productive, particularly the faculty and research dollars and in fundraising private money and so on. So even if state dollars stay level, as that grows, it's a smaller percentage. That said, there's, there's no question, it, it seems to me, that there's, there's a profound problem there. And I, I think it's at several levels. Um, Jim, I, th I maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, Bobby, you may know this too, but something like a fifth of the students here now are first generation, is that? 20%, so a fifth, which is remarkable. I mean, I was, I was quite surprised. Um, that's something we have to hold on to. I mean, this university historically has opened, if you think about it, I mean, it makes no sense that an institution of this caliber was created in this poor state in the South. Right? And yet it's been here, and it's through that kind of public support, opened doors of opportunity to generations of students who otherwise never would have had access to higher education. Now, that's a win for them. But as I said, it seems to me that's also a very important win for the state of North Carolina. It's an investment in that hum human potential that pays off decades after those students graduate. Uh, so I, I worry about opportunity. The other thing I worry about is that as there's no doubt that, I mean, I think for faculty on campus, um, you know, we go through how many years of no raise and watch tuition growing up, the state contribution in proportional terms shrinking. The real risk is that faculty begin to lose that sense that this is a public university. I mean, people who come on campus, they'll say, I feel this thing here. I don't know what it is. People tell me it's the Carolina way, and, and, and they say, what is that? And, well, I can't really answer it, but is this, I think a large part of it is that long-standing commitment to engagement of connecting the work we do in the library, in the art studio, in the laboratory, in the classroom, to things that matter out there. And I just worry that that's at risk as well. I mean, it's, again, quite remarkable if you think about this faculty and the fact that they come from every direction from around the globe and they come here and they embrace that idea. What a magnificent thing. But I worry that that's at risk as well. Do one more, Jim? Yeah, one or, one or two more. Okay, great. Thank you.